Well, hello. We're here, ready here again this week for a go ahead and dive into Luke and begin to continue our study through that in our own campus small groups. Uh, so if you are one of those who lead, teach, or facilitate an on-campus small group as meeting on Sunday, March the 19th, you've got the right video, and hopefully we're going to help you with uh, getting prepared to do just that. I appreciate what you do each Sunday and leading those on-campus small groups and, and helping uh, people grow in their faith and helping us as a congregation uh, carry out discipleship. And so that's what we're going to be doing today. Uh, we continue, of course, in our study of Luke, and I, I know I say this every week, but I can't help but uh, reiterate it to us because I see so uh, significantly what's happening in our lives as a congregation, as a people, as we're focusing together on this uh, Gospel of Luke through our sermon series, through our daily readings, and through our own campus small groups. And so we're going to keep on doing that. And this Sunday, what we're going to be looking at is a passage out of Luke chapter 9. So if you haven't already done so, go ahead and make sure you've got the lesson printed out in front of you there. You should have received that uh, in an email uh, prior to the one you got with this link for the video. Uh, get your Bible, uh, something to take some notes with, and let's see if we can just help each other out a little bit, okay? Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to kind of do three things in this video. Uh, we're going to talk about the overall aspect of what this uh, lesson is focusing in on, uh, kind of the big idea. I'm going to give you a little bit of some background, biblical background, a little additional things from that maybe weren't in the lesson material itself, and then uh, a couple of things to maybe th think through or, or ideas in regards to uh, teaching uh, teaching this lesson or interacting with your own campus small group. Okay, uh, so let, let's get started here, and we're going to start off by just talking about the big idea of this le lesson. We're beginning look for Luke chapter nine. We're looking at verses 51 through 62. And really what the bottom line is for our lesson is we're challenging, we're being challenged, all of us are going to be challenged to uh, take a good look at ourselves and to see if there are things that we're allowing to keep us from being involved in the mission that God has called us to. And we're going to notice that it is this mission is so important, so significant, that we should not be willing to allow anything to keep us from carrying out God's mission and God's calling on our life as his follower. And so that's really what we're going to be wrestling with. Now, I'll just be right up front with you. It's going to create a lot of tension for many of us because the reality is for many of us, we've, we've allowed things to come into our lives. Uh, we've allowed things to distract us. We've allowed things to get our attention. We've allowed things to get our involvements, our, our commitment, our participation. So that really maybe we find ourselves just not only uh, not being involved, uh, not even uh, involved into the, to God's mission to the level we'd like, but not involved whatsoever. In fact, it may be an afterthought for us. And what we're going to be wrestling with in this lesson is seeing the significance of this mission and then uh, wrestling with how, how are, are we placing the same significance of God's mission uh, in our lives uh, in the same level as he's called us to. That's really what we're going to be wrestling with, okay? And, and so it is an opportunity for there to be some tensions to develop uh, in our lives as we prepare to lead, facilitate, teach this, and to think through what does that exactly look like. And so uh, so get ready for that. Get ready for that when you lead. Teach that on-campus small group because you're going to be challenging yourself and your preparation, but you're also going to be, the scripture is going to be challenging your small group members in regards to thinking that through for themselves and what that should look like in their own lives. Okay, so that's kind of the overview there. Now let's talk about the text for just a moment. Luke chapter fifty-one. Uh, excuse me, Luke chapter nine, verses fifty-one through sixty-two. Now that text is actually kind of divided into two sections that we're looking at. The first is sections fifty-one through fifty-five, and this deals with some some things preceding. Uh, the next several verses that deal with some interactions Jesus had, particularly three individuals. It's very important, I think, for us not to lose sight of those previous verses. Sometimes we just kind of want to skim through 51 through 55 and jump into 56. But I think we'll, it, it, it's very important, I think, for us to instead dwell significant time on 51 through 55 because that helps us understand the significance of these questions, these interactions there. Now, 51 through 55, 
then that those verses where Luke records for us how Jesus travels from Galilee to Jerusalem, and he's headed to Jerusalem, as we know, now looking back uh, in regards to his death, burial, and resurrection, and ultimately his ascension into heaven. And I think it's important we see this, what happens as Jesus is making this journey, and then as he encounter, has these interactions with these three different individuals on this journey. And keeping in mind the ultimate goal, the ultimate mission, uh, the ultimate purpose, and that is for Jesus to go to Jerusalem to offer himself as a sacrifice on a cross for me and you, for all who will believe in him, to be buried and to be raised again, ultimately to send back into heaven with the Father, that his mission encompasses all of that. And that is what he is headed to do. That is where he is going. That is what he is focused upon. And the ultimate, obviously, the ultimate reason for that is so that he can offer to us salvation, so we can be made right with God through the gospel. So keep that in mind. Now, with that, look at, look at verse 51. It said, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Don't lose sight of that. 51, resolutely. He, that, he is totally committed, totally dedicated, totally devoted, totally focused on going to Jerusalem because of what's going to happen there. And he's not going to let anything or anyone uh, deter him or keep him from carrying out his mission. That's important for us to grab that. There's nothing that Jesus has determined. There's nothing that's going to stop him from carrying out that mission. Nothing, no one. And keep that in mind because that is, Jesus is going to be calling us to the same type of devotion to his mission that he hands off to me and you. Now, in this, it's interesting that he goes from Galilee to Samaria. As he's traveling to Galilee and Samaria, obviously he has to go through through, uh, through, through this area called Samaria. And what's significant about that is the people that live there. It took about three days walk, three days travel, <coughs> pardon me, to go from Galilee to Jerusalem. And you would go through Samaria. And this, the people, of course, that live there are the Samaritans. Now, what is significant about that is some things about those folks. The, the Samaritans were considered by the pious Jews as... Um, as not pure Jews. In other words, most pious Jews considered the Samaritans to kind of be kind of half-breeds, that they weren't pure-blooded Jews, that they had intermarried in, in days gone by, that the Jews of that country, or their area, had intermarried with uh, people outside of the Jewish race, and that they were considered by, by pious Jews as being kind of uh, half-blooded pagans, maybe even apostates. <clears throat> And there was a hostility there between the pious Jews and the Samaritans. Uh, there was a racial a hostility. There was a religious hostility. Uh, because in, in, in reacting to the hostility that the S Samaritans received from the Jews, uh, they, they had, they had uh, developed a sense where they rejected uh, the Jewish scriptures except for the first five books of what we would call the Bible, the Pentateuch. And they had rejected Jer Jerusalem as the center of the legitimate site for worship. And so when people would travel through Samaria, the Jews would travel through Samaria going to Jerusalem, there was a natural resistance to that <clears throat> because these Samaritans didn't see Jerusalem as a legitimate place of worship. <coughs> Pardon me. So they saw... So there was a resistance. These Jews that would travel through were unwelcome visitors, basically, because they were going to Jerusalem to worship, which the Samaritans saw as not a legitimate place of worship. Now, by the way, some of the uh, bias, some of the racial uh, hostility there that the Jews had against the Samaritans may have actually been unfounded because it's not real clear if those Samaritans were truly not true or were not true-blooded Jews. They may have been, but over time, that hostility, that animosity, uh, had that prejudice had developed so that it was so strong there that when Jesus traveled through there and he sent those messengers to arrange, it's, 
arrange a place for them to stay. It says that they were not welcome, and Jesus was basically rejected. Now, keep in mind, he was not rejected because he was claiming to be the Messiah. He was rejected because he was a Jew, a pious, what they would, Samaritans were considered as a pious Jew. Now, that helps us understand a little bit how the difference between James and John's response and Jesus' response. James and John pretty much got indignant. They had already had all these bi- this racial and religious biases, hostility, prejudice. So basically they said, Jesus, let's just call down fire from heaven. Let's do an Elijah deal and let's just wipe these folks out. But instead, Jesus responds in a totally different way. He actually rebukes James and John for their response and, and kind of puts them in their place, to be quite honest there. As you see in verse, verse 55, he said he rebuked them and they went on to another village. So why did Jesus rebuke them? Remember John 3, 16 through 17? Jesus said he came into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. James and John were calling down, they wanted to call down God's judgment on these people. Jesus had come to give grace and to offer salvation. In fact, later on, some of these same villages would be villages that would hear the gospel preached and would respond to it. Now, with that in mind, with that background there, let's look now (coughs) at these verses that follow. Because here is where Jesus comes into contact with three different individuals. And we've got this backdrop now of where Jesus is so focused on the mission that he's not going to let anything, anyone keep him from carrying it out. He's also a mission of grace that he's offering to even those who do not respond favorably to him. And in other words, he doesn't respond to rejection with retaliation. He responds to rejection with grace. And then we come into this next section where it's really about discipleship. It's about raising the level of our discipleship, of our what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And there's three interactions that take place here. And in those three interactions, I'm not going to read them to you. you, you you've read them, looked at them, you'll be kind of familiar with them. <coughs> there is a call to either by Jesus to follow him or these offer to follow Jesus. And Jesus responds to that with a challenge designed not to discourage them, but to help them raise their level of commitment, directing them realize that they need the same kind of devotion to the mission as Jesus has to it. I hope that makes sense. In the first interaction where the man wants to go and, and bury, uh, bury his, uh, or excuse me, where the man goes, man, man says, I want to follow you, and I'll go wherever you want to go, and Jesus raises the issue of having the material comforts of that day. Basically what he's saying to him, you need to seriously consider <coughs> the personal cost of following me. Take serious consideration of that. The second interaction where the guy asked, can I go and bury my mother and father? And there's some good discussion in your material about that. So I want to get into that. But basically what Jesus is doing here, he's not lacking compassion when he responds back to this guy. Basically, he's telling him that you've got to raise the level of your commitment to God's mission and see the importance of it. so that nothing is allowed to keep you from it. And then in the third interaction, what Jesus is telling this guy here and telling us, by the way, all three of those, you've got to stay focused on the mission. You can't allow anything or anyone to distract you from it. And I would suggest to you, you go back to the previous verses, James and John were, in a sense, in their response to those Samaritans' rejection, were were actually serving as a distraction to God's mission, to the mission that Jesus had. And Jesus rebuked them for it and said, hey, we're not going to get caught up in that. I'm headed to Jerusalem to do something, to carry out a mission that is of vital importance, and nothing and no one can keep us from that. 
and Jesus hands off that mission to me and you. He gives that to us. He says in John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. He's handed that mission off to us. And our level of discipleship is being challenged here as carrying out that mission that we will be followers of Jesus in the true sense, that we're willing to follow him and have the same level of commitment to the mission as Jesus had. Now, as you get into teaching the text, here's, here's a, a, a kind of a, maybe a little bit of an alternative idea for you, and it may not work. You may choose to do something differently, but just a thought. Here's kind of a little teaching tip. What I would say this is spend time teaching through the verses 51 through 55, setting that backdrop like we've just done. Then, what, what might be, here's a possible idea to use, is then divide your class, your small group, into three different other groups or sections and hand off to them the verses that correspond with each one of the interactions that Jesus has with these individuals. <clears throat> and I apologize, I've been dealing with some uh, congestion and my voice may sound funny and this cough keeps sneaking in on me, so my bad. But here, here's what you could do with those. Hand off, get, kind of divide your group out, and obviously it would be helpful if you picked out three people to serve as point folks for each one of those groups prior to class time, small group time. Then hand them off, say, I want you guys to, each group, to look at the passage of Scripture, the interaction, discuss that among yourselves, and wrestle with these two questions. Then we're going to come back together and hear from each group. Ask what was really behind the person's statement or question. For instance, what was behind the, the guy's really statement? He said, "Where well, I'll I will uh, I'll follow you wherever you go." What was really behind that? <clears throat> and then, how did Jesus's response reveal that? And with each one of those, kind of go through that way. And as you do that, and then here's the other thoughts you might have those, those groups wrestle with. What does Jesus' response to those people of that day uh, expose in their lives and in ours today in regards to carrying out the mission? And I think you'll find some interesting answers there. And some things hopefully will be helpful, not only for, for the group, for you, but also for the group as a whole. By the way, here's another thing that you might could throw out to the group kind of as a finishing idea or a concluding idea, a practical application. You know, uh, we're kind of in the middle of what's often referred to as Lent, the 40 days of Lent between Ash Wednesday and, <clears throat> uh, and Good Friday. And obviously uh, what happens a lot of times between those 40 days of Lent is people will be giving up something, quote, you know, something they're going to give up uh, for God and uh, in the, and during that time period to help them focus on God, focus on Jesus in regarding to Easter. Uh, maybe use that, leverage that a little bit with your groups and challenging them. What are some things that you've seen, maybe some things that are distracting you, maybe some excuses that you've been using, uh, maybe some things that have been challenging your loyalty, your commitment to the to the mission of God, what are some things that you would be say, I'm going to be willing to give that up or limit that for the remainder of Lent till Easter? And so I can focus more on the mission that God has called us to. And uh, help them maybe think that through as a group and think that through as individuals. It may be something you just throw out there <coughs> where they don't actually respond back to you. Uh, but ask them maybe to, to jot down something or to mentally make note of that, that, hey, for the next 40, that remainder of the time between now and Easter, I'm going to limit that. I'm going to give that up with the purpose of making my focus more on the mission that God has given to us. And that mission is what? Give every man, woman, and child repeated opportunities to hear and see the gospel. All right. Have a great time studying the scriptures together. Hopefully this has been a little bit of help to you. You know, in your material, you've got the conclusion there. You've got 
uh, that application moment. You've got the group handout. You know where those are. You've done this enough. Uh, so be sure to, to take advantage and use those and enjoy your time together and having conversations about God, challenging each other in your walk with Jesus, encouraging each other, and discovering His truth for you. God.